Dear God, thank you for this day that you have blessed us with, that we can come together and celebrate Alexander and Abby and this bond that they're uh, you're going to create today. And Lord, please be with them throughout their lives and help them to help one another, to serve you, and to hopefully get to, to heaven one day together. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Alexander and Abby, we are all here today for you. We are here to celebrate with you the new life that you're beginning together. We are here to be witnesses of the vows that you're making to each other as you commit your lives to one another today. And this event is as important as it gets in life. So pure and sacred and important is marriage that when God sought to help us understand what our relationship with Him was like, He chose marriage as the illustration for it, both in the Old and New Testament. It is marriage that teaches us what our relationship with Him is like, and that then teaches us about our own marriages as well and what they should be like. Abby to the woman, Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And subjection, of course, is not an easy task. It's never easy to say no to yourself and yes to someone else. But the reality is this is not just something that women are called to do, though women are called to do this in this unique way. But all Christians must be submissive people, submitting to their elders, submitting to one another, submitting to God. Saying no to self is the hallmark of who we are as people of faith. But it's not highly regarded in our society. Of all the four-letter words that you shouldn't say, probably on top of the list these days is obey. No one wants to do that. No one wants to hear that. And of course, that is what you are called to do in a special way in this relationship. You think of Sarah, who Peter points to as calling Abraham Lord. But of course, the only time that the scriptures tell us that Sarah does that is when she is speaking in her own heart about her relationship with her husband. It's not because someone is watching. It's not just because he is there listening. It's not because the other women are trashing their husbands. It's only when nobody else knows except her that she still has that attitude toward her husband. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for allowing us to be able to do this today, be able to get married and commit our lives to each other. We ask that you please be with us throughout the course of our marriage and help us to, to stay on the path to keep pressing forward to the ultimate goal of heaven. Please be with me as I lead the family and help me to lead us in the right direction in all things. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Alexander, Paul says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. But this really isn't a call to authority. It's a call to responsibility and the utmost of responsibility. And from the moment you, res you, you accept this responsibility, Paul says your life is, is forfeit because your leadership and your authority is just as Christ gave his life for the church. In that same way, you must give your life for Abby. You must love her life more than you love your own. And so as we think of these obligations, Alexander, do you pledge to ever strive to be the sort of husband that God would have you to be? I do. And Abby, do you pledge to ever strive to be the sort of wife that God would have you to be? I do. You have written your own vows for this time, and you can exchange them at this point. Abby. There are some things you can't share together without ending up liking each other. But I feel like we tried with all of the times that we didn't know that we were in the same room or didn't know that we were at the same camp or hadn't really spent much time together yet. But everything that we've done together, everything that we've shared, 
is something that has made me grow closer to you and love you more. I commit to being supportive, and when you need me to listen, I will. <clears throat> and we'll go through life side by side, hand in hand, and enjoy the wonderful time spent with each other. I can't imagine a better wife or a better way to spend the rest of my life than with you by my side. So today and every day of my life, I choose to have you as my best friend, my partner, and my wife. Alexander, I only wasted three days trying to convince myself that I just wanted to be friends. After that, it took me four days to realize I wanted to marry you. In the past five years, you have loved me when I believed I was unlovable, forgiven me when I thought I was unforgivable, and showed me kindness and patience far more than I ought, far more often than I ever deserved. You have taught me what grace and self-sacrifice looks like more than I thought possible. You are my constant shoulder to cry on, hand to hold, and rock to center me when I am unsteady. And now, standing before God, our family and friends, I promise to be your cheerleader through every success, your gentle reassurance when times are tough, your quiet encouragement when the, Lord, when the world is loud, and your guiding hand to hold you in times of doubt. I promise, <laughs> I promise to be your best friend when your soul needs laughter, and your wife and lover when your heart needs care. I promise to be your helpmate and to respect and honor you. I promise to serve you as the church serves Christ. I promise to humble myself when I fall short because I know I will. I promise to always forgive you when you do the same. I promise to put God first and our marriage second, no matter what comes our way. I promise to love you selflessly and pursue you daily, just as I did when we first fell in love. I promise to love you for the rest of our lives, in sickness and health, for rich or for poor, for better or worse, till death or the Lord calls us. The last thing Paul has to say in this text is a quotation from the very first wedding ever performed, the one that God performs as he creates Eve for Adam. And he says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Alexander, today you are taking your place as the head of your own household with your responsibilities and obligations to Abby taking priority in your life. And Abby, as you leave your parents to be joined to Alexander, it is to him that you must turn first and for, for support. And in times of trouble and discouragement, it is his leadership that you must follow. These two who were previously two are today joined together as one, which is not just the joy of physical love, but absolute loyalty and unity to one another. One of the most remarkable things about this new unity that you share for the rest of your lives is I think something that's easy to miss. Because as God created humankind in his image, he created both male and female in his image with everything that is unique about who we are. And God is sometimes described in masculine terms, which tells us that the greatest things about masculinity and fatherhood come from the character of God. But God is also sometimes described in feminine terms, which reminds us that the greatest things of femininity and womanhood and motherhood come from the character of God. But what that means, among other things, is that each of you possesses something that the other is lacking from the character of God. And as the two of you are joined together today and for the rest of your lives, you become a little more like him by supplying to the other one what he or she lacks. <clears throat> 